Hey guys, welcome back. This is going to be USMLE Step 1, High Yield Images Part 4. Uh, if you haven't seen the last part of this uh, video series, I'll put the link right here so you can go ahead and view that. Uh, and we'll just go ahead and get started. So this is going to be the first picture, and uh, this is an x-ray of the neck, and the thing, the structure that we're looking at is going to be right here. So this is actually a thumb sign. Uh, if you put your thumb up there, you can, you can kind of see it. So a thumb sign uh, in a lateral neck x-ray is classic for one condition, and that is epiglottitis. Uh, epiglottitis, when you see it on the boards, uh, it's usually going to present in a kid. It is a medical emergency, so it's something that you want to deal with very quickly. And one of the most common organisms that causes epiglottitis is going to be Haemophilus influenza. So if you see this thumb-like structure in the neck on an x-ray, you want to be thinking epiglottitis, and you want to be thinking Haemophilus influenza. This next one is uh, definitely something you should know. It's very high yield. This is an image of the basal ganglia, and the arrow here is pointing specifically at the substantia nigra. And the reason that this is important is obviously because of Parkinson's disease. Uh, in Parkinson's disease, you see a depigmentation of the substantia nigra, the substantia nigra of pars compacta, specifically. So if you look at A here, it's a little bit darker on both sides. B, not very dark at all. So you're seeing this depigmentation of the substantia nigra, and that's something that's commonly seen in Parkinson, Parkinson's disease. So it is highly likely that you might see an image like this, and they'll ask you what the structure is, or what the reason, or what disease is associated with this condition right here. Uh, this next image is going to be a picture of clue cells. So a couple high yield things to know about this. Um, the first thing is they want you to know what type of cell this is that you're actually looking at. So uh, clue cells are obviously going to be associated with bacterial vaginosis. So that's that's your first clue. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, but uh, So these are going to be vaginal epithelial cells that you're looking at. And the reason that they look like this, have this kind of... Um, blurred appearance, if you will, is because they're covered in the causative organism, which is Gardnerella vaginalis. So again, these are vaginal epithelial cells that are covered in a lot of Gardnerella vaginalis, and that is the bug that causes bacterial vaginosis. A couple high yield things to know about that as well uh, is that this condition, bacterial vaginosis, is characterized by a gray discharge. Some people say it has a kind of fishy odor. So if you hear any buzzwords like that, you want to be thinking of Gardnerella. And also very high yield is that the condition, um, the, the discharge from the va vagina has a pH greater than 4.5. That's going to be very important in differentiating it from other um, conditions that will affect that area. pH greater than 4.5, gray discharge, fishy odor. You want to be thinking Gardnerella, and you might see these clue cells on histology. This next image is a picture of the adrenal gland, uh, and it's associated with the condition. We're seeing a lot of hemorrhaging of the adrenal glands here, and that is definitely a, a buzz term, hemorrhaging of the adrenal glands. If you hear something like that, you want to be thinking of Waterhouse-Fredrickson syndrome. Hemorrhaging of the adrenal glands, Waterhouse-Fredrickson syndrome. Some important things about that, obviously, if you have this massive hemorrhaging of the adrenal glands, they're not going to be functioning properly. So you're going to get a primary adrenal insufficiency. Primary because it's affecting the adrenal glands directly. It's not coming from another source. Uh, and this waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome is caused by three main, main things. It can be caused by Neisseria meningitidis, uh, obviously associated with meningococcemia, primarily in kids. It can be caused by DIC, and it can be caused by shock. So if you see anything like this, really bloodied adrenal glands or someone who is low in certain adrenal hormones, you want to be thinking Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome and those three main causes. This next one is a chest x-ray, and this is a good picture of pulmonary fibrosis. So the way this is commonly described is a bilateral and diffuse. It's bilateral, it's on both sides, and it's diffuse throughout the whole lung. Uh, it's a pattern of small, irregular, also called reticulonodular opacities uh, that are most pronounced in the lower lobe. So on the left lung here is a good example. You see up here, it's, you don't really see these kind of uh, opacities very much, but down here in the lower lobes, you'll see them very well. So this is a good chest x-ray to remember, very high yield. You'll probably see something about this pulmonary fibrosis. 
This next one um, is a giveaway most of the time because not a lot of things look like this. This is a, an example of hemochromatosis. And the reason that it looks like this is because a Prussian blue stain has been used and that distinguishes the iron from lipofusin. So all this blue stuff here we're seeing is iron deposits. And if you ever see something like this with a lot of iron deposited in a particular area, you wanna be thinking about hemochromatosis. A couple of high yield points about that condition. Um, one uh, HLA antigen that it's associated with is HLA-A3. So if you see anything mentioned about HLA-A3, you want to be thinking about hemochromatosis. Uh, additionally, if you hear uh, in the vignette, it's talking about a patient with bronze diabetes. That's usually the buzzword. Sometimes they'll say bronze diabetes. Sometimes they'll say a patient with skin hyperpigmentation as well as diabetes mellitus. So they might word it either of those ways. But if you hear anything like that, definitely want to jump to hemochromatosis. That's almost a dead giveaway. Uh, and then also one high yield thing to know is the treatment. Obviously, if you have a buildup of iron, you want to give the patient something that will get rid of the iron. And one of the common drugs used is deferoxamine, which is an iron chelator. So a couple high yield points there to know about hemochromatosis. This next one is an x-ray and we kind of see the arrows pointed to this area right here. You kind of see the same thing over here as well. This is going to be an example of Ewing sarcoma. Uh, so this is a classic finding on x-ray. You'll see this kind of onion skinning, the different lines or the different layers here of the tumor. Uh, and Ewing sarcoma is associated with a translocation between chromosome 11 and chromosome 22. The way a lot of students remember that is 11 plus 22 equals 33, and that was Patrick Ewing's number. He's a basketball player, so Patrick Ewing, Ewing sarcoma, translocation 1122, and this onion skin appearance of the bone. Very high yield to know that. This next picture, uh, if you see this, it's almost a dead giveaway for what you need. Uh, this is an example of Giardia lamblia. Uh, specifically, this is the trophozoite form. So if you see anything that looks like this, it's almost a dead giveaway that it's probably going to be talking about Giardia lamblia. Um, the important thing to know here is that these trophozoites can be detected in stool. Uh, and one other important thing to know about giardiasis, the condition that's caused by this uh, trophozoit, is that an IgA deficiency predisposes a patient to chronic giardiasis. Let me say that again. An IgA deficiency predisposes a patient to chronic giardiasis. The reason being IgA is the antibody that uh, mainly lines the gut like the, the mucosal antibody. So if you're deficient in that, it's a lot easier for some opportunistic pathogens like Giardia to get in and infect you. Uh, this next one, going back to some more microbiology, this is an example of Malassezia furfur. Uh, this is seen under a KOH prep, and the way that it's commonly described is the kind of spaghetti and meatballs appearance. So obviously right here in the center, you see the meatballs, and then on the periphery here, you see the spaghetti. So Malassezia furfur, spaghetti and meatball appearance. Um, and do you remember what the, the primary condition caused by this organism is? That's going to be tinea versicolor. Might also be called pteriasis versicolor. Usually seen on the back, those kind of hypopigmented spots uh, that you'll see. And if you see something like that, you definitely want to be thinking of Malassezia furfur. This next image is an example of a Lewy body. Um, very high yield image to know, very high yield to know everything associated with this. So a Lewy body is an eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusion. So it's eosinophilic, it's pink, and we see it in the cytoplasm here, seen in neurons, and it's associated with what two diseases? Parkinson disease and Lewy body dementia. The name is kind of self-explanatory. So you see this, you wanna be thinking of Parkinson disease or Lewy body dementia. It is also very high yield to know what exactly this is composed of. It's not good enough to know just eosinophilic. It is composed of alpha synuclein. So Lewy bodies are composed of alpha synuclein. The way I kind of like to remember this picture, if anyone's ever seen kind of like a broken computer screen, or if you've ever like put a magnet to a computer screen, you kind of get that blurred out area. That's what this looks like to me. It's kind of like a blurred out area within the cell. And if you see something like that, you want to be thinking of a Lewy body. This next image is also very high yield. This is an example of a Bent-Jones protein. Uh, and what condition are these seen in? 
that's going to be multiple myeloma. Ben's Jones proteins, you're thinking multiple myeloma. Some high yield things, uh, you shouldn't just know the name, you need to know what it actually is. So this is a light chain from an immunoglobulin seen in the urine. This can be picked up in the urine. Uh, and also you want to know obviously the association with multiple myeloma and a lot of the associations there. The M spike that you'll see in the immunoglobulin levels, they may say that um, by name, M spike, or they might give you a graph that will show you that classic M spike appearance. Uh, an another few things to know about multiple myeloma is the RULO formation. It's the stacked kind of coin appearance of red blood cells that's called a RULO. So those are also associated with multiple myeloma. And then the last thing, and maybe the most high yield thing, is these punched out lytic lesions that you see with multiple myeloma, commonly seen in the skull, in the uh, spinal vertebra, and in the pelvis. If you see an x-ray of that and it looks kind of splotchy, punched out, you definitely want to be thinking of multiple myeloma and the association with Bench jones proteins. This next image is an example of hyaline arteriosclerosis. Let me say that again because it can be really easy to mix up some terminology here. Highline arteriolosclerosis. Okay, the important thing to know here, this thickening of the artery you see here with all this hyaline material, there's two common things that cause this, and those are essential hypertension and diabetes mellitus. So if you have a patient that has that, they show you some histology of a blood vessel, you definitely want to be thinking hyaline arteriolosclerosis. This picture is an example of retinitis pigmentosa, retinitis pigmentosa. Um, so this presents with kind of bony spicule shape. You kind of see them right here. Here's a really good one. These kind of spicules um, that are being deposited around the macula. So you see them surrounding here. Um, some important things that you might see in the vignette is that it is completely painless. The patient won't have any discomfort associated with this. And usually the first sign um, with this condition is a loss of night vision. And the reason for that is because the rods are affected before the cones. Remember, rods are for more black and white, uh, low detail, night kind of vision. So those will be damaged first, and that's why you'll have a, a loss of night vision associated with retinitis pigmentosa. This next image is an example of renal clear cell carcinoma. Um, there are several different clear cell carcinomas that can occur in the body, but this one is going to be affecting the kidneys primarily. Um, some, the, really the one important thing to note here is why they're so clear, and it's because all of these cells are filled with, what are they filled with? Glycogen. These cells are primarily filled with glycogen, also some lipids, but if you ever get that question, what are they filled with? It's going to be glycogen. Um, this next picture, my mouse was right on it right here. So this is an example of a ring enhancing lesion. You see it right here, a CT or an MRI that shows this. It'll be an enhanced ring. Um, and there's really two main conditions that are associated with this. The first is going to be toxoplasmosis, and the second is going to be a CNS lymphoma. Uh, for the purposes of boards, if you see this, it's probably going to be toxoplasmosis. Look for other buzzwords in the vignette, maybe a pregnant woman that was cleaning a kitty litter or something like that because of the association with cats. But if you see an image like this, this ring enhancing lesion in the brain, you want to be thinking toxoplasmosis and also possibly uh, less likely a CNS lymphoma that they're asking about. Um, this next picture is an example of heart failure cells. So you should try to orient yourself here um, and first try and figure out where you are. So we're in the alveoli because you can kind of see these alveolar sacs. Um, for the most part, you see some that are broken up here, but then you see a couple complete ones as, as well. And these heart failure cells are hemosiderin-laden macrophages um, in the alveoli. And, and the reason that they're called heart failure cells is because some of the um, red blood cells are able to get into the alveoli and they're, they're damaged and broken down. And the macrophages will take up those damaged byproducts, and that gives them this kind of brownish appearance. It's called the hemosiderin laid in macrophage because it has hemosiderin. Um, so if you see something like this in the alveoli, obviously this is abnormal. Alveoli should usually be pretty clear. Uh, but if you see something like this, you want to be thinking heart failure and heart failure cells. This next one uh, is pretty much almost a dead giveaway if you ever see a picture like this. And because of that, you probably won't see a picture, but I wanted to include it just in case. 
This is an example of paracoccidioides. Uh, some important things to know here. It's a budding yeast. Obviously, you see it budding out just like this. Uh, and it has that captain's wheel formation. Uh, two more important things to know. Compared to red blood cells, if they do give you that comparison, paracoccidioides is much larger than red blood cells. Um, and also, it is seen in Latin America. So usually with these types of uh, bugs, they'll give you a, lo a location, you know, Ohio River Valley, uh, New Mexico, Latin America. In that case, for Latin America, you want to be thinking of paracoccidioides. Okay, uh, this is going to be an example of echinocytes. Uh, they're also called Burr cells. So an echinocyte, you see them right here. These are red blood cells with a thorny, kind of spiky appearance um, that are seen in several different conditions, and it is important to know what conditions these are seen in. The first one is a pyruvate kinase deficiency. So obviously you're going to get some problems with glycolysis in these patients. These can also be seen in uremia, in patients with kidney failure, uh, and also in microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. And finally, this can be from just mechanical damage. So four um, main conditions that you want to know that if you see a blood smear, you'll see these echinocytes, also called Burr cells, B-U-R-R -R cells. Uh, this next one is a little bit harder. Um, CT scans like this, what I recommend you do is just try to orient yourself, you know, don't get confused. This is, this is the right side, this is the left side. Try to see what level they're at, try and see if you can figure out any structures, kidneys, uh, lungs, liver, that kind of thing, and try and figure it out. Because um, these can be very difficult, but just try and orient yourself, remember left from right, and then look for any abnormalities. And in this case, the abnormality is going to be right here. So this is an example of restrictive pericarditis. So what we're looking at at this level, this is going to be like upper thoracics, uh, I'd say. So we're looking at the heart with some of the main vessels over here. And right around here, this kind of whitish rim, this represents calcification lining the pericardium. This is probably one of the harder images that you'll see, but I have seen images like this on practice tests and the exam, that kind of thing. So it is important to know. So just orient yourself. In this case, this calcification right around here in the pericardium represents restrictive pericarditis. And I believe this is going to be the last image uh, for this video. This is neurofibrillary tangles. So a couple important things to know here. We already talked about Lewy bodies. Those were really important. And those were composed of what? Alpha synuclein, right? So in this case, these neurofibrillary tangles, these are protein aggregates also in neurons. And this is caused by hyperphosphorylation of tau protein. Very high yield. Let me say that again. These neurofibrillary tangles are caused by hyperphosphorylation of tau protein. And these are uh, nearly pathognomonic for Alzheimer's disease. So you really want to know Lewy bodies and their associations and neurofibrillary tangles and their description and their associations as well. Uh, so that's the end of this video. Uh, I just want to thank everyone again who's been watching, who's subscribed and commented. If you haven't already, please subscribe. Leave me comments for any future videos, suggestions on what you want me to do. Uh, thank you so much for watching, and I'll talk to you soon.